We're excited about what God's doing here and what this morning's going to be, and uh, we're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 98. Let's stand as we read from God's Word. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. Hello. All right, y'all are already standing. That's awesome. You ready to sing? I like it. Let's do it. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed as living he loved me Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. 
One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. The hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. As living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day, he glorious day, oh glorious day. And one day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose, oh death he had conquered now is ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him from rising again as living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved one bring in my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he cared sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, glorious day. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell in safety, and this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Luke 1, uh, 30 through 33. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will reconcile. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Y'all stand again, we'll sing praises to that promised king. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king.
morning. Y'all may be seated. Good to see you guys this morning. Grateful for your, your presence here as we gather together to study God's Word, to worship, and to all those things that we know we hold so dear to be in the presence of the Lord with His people. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel will be in chapters 1. As you know, perhaps last week we started a, an Advent series, if you will. As we approach December 25th, that celebration of Christmas, we celebrate Advent. We've been lighting the Advent candles these first couple of Sundays. Uh, the, the first two candles represent hope and peace. Next week we'll light that pink one that stands for, for joy. And all these things are done in anticipation or to remind us of what it was like to wait for the first coming of Christ and also to remind us that we are right now, as Ernie mentioned, we are right now awaiting His return. Advent's about waiting for the arrival of Christ, whether it was the first time He came or now uh, the second time. And as we looked at, as we look at this idea of waiting for His, his arrival and reminding ourselves that He has come and that He's coming again, uh, we recognize that there are a lot of passages in the Old Testament in particular that talk about the birth and the life and the purpose of the coming Messiah. There are multiple prophecies that detail everywhere from where he was to be born to what he will be doing. But beyond just those specific prophecies, those direct predictions about who Messiah will be, there are in the Old Testament what we call types of Christ. And these are individuals whose lives or the events in their lives give us a picture of who Christ will be. So do you have the direct prophecies that tell you, things like in Micah that talks about how he will be born in Bethlehem, but you also have people's lives like Joseph or David, for example, who parts of their lives give us pictures as to what the Messiah's life was to be like. Well, beyond that, there are also, I believe in the Old Testament, several what we call types or pictures, not just of the life of Christ, but of the birth of Christ. And so last week we looked at the first one of those. We looked at the birth of Samson. Samson's mother, of course, was unable to have kids. And yet in the midst of that, a miraculous move of God enabled Manoah's wife, that's all we know her by, to miraculously give birth to Samson, who was going to be a deliverer. And in that way, that birth and Samson's role as a deliverer is a type, a picture of what would be taking place in the life of Christ when he was going to be born to be our deliverer. This morning, we're going to be looking at Samuel and the circumstances around his birth. And as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, I'll just point out to you that Samuel, where Samson was our deliverer, Samuel was both a prophet and a priest. He served both those roles for the people of Israel. And the same way that Samuel is both a prophet, that is, he was one who brought God's word to the people. He was also someone who served in that role of priest. He also made sacrifices. We see that when he's dealing with David and when he's dealing with Saul and others, that the Bible describes Jesus as our great high priest. So in the birth of Samuel, we see, in the life of Samuel, we see not only someone who is a prophet and a priest, we see in those things he gives us a picture of Christ being our priest and Christ being our prophet, but even Samuel's birth is miraculous. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathiam Zophim, and I just made that up, by the way. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. Feel free, to, feel free to make up your own pronunciation. From the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And Ernie, aren't you glad I didn't ask you to read that one this morning? <laughs> he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her arrival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her, so she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? 
Hannah arose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. It came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard, so Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Heavenly Father, as we approach this passage this morning, as we approach this account, would you give us as well favor and grace that we may understand and that we may see and that, Father, these words would encourage and strengthen and teach us. That, Father, we would see the work of Christ in the work of Samuel. We would see the birth of Christ in the birth of Samuel. Order to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the setting here in 1 Samuel is probably just a few years, maybe at most a couple of decades, if even that long, since the life of Samson. And even though we didn't read it, I would take your attention to chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. And in that, you're going to see what was going on in the life of Israel in the era of Samuel. In chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, it says this, The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and words of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Now, why do I draw your attention to that? Because I want you to understand, as we come to the birth of Samuel, that the Lord was not actively speaking. There wasn't a lot of prophecies going out. It was a time of relative silence from God to the people of Israel. Now, the Bible does not specifically tell us why that was the, that was the case, but I don't think it probably takes a lot of imagination to figure it out. If you remember when we talked about Samson just last week, we recognized that things had gotten so bad in Israel in Samson's day. And Samson's day, by the way, is not too long before these days of Samuel. That in Samson's day, before he was born, Israel had gotten so comfortable with its sin, so comfortable with its idolatry, so comfortable with its rebellion against God, and so comfortable with the oppression of the Philistines that they had lost all hope, and they weren't even crying out to God anymore in repentance. You may remember that throughout the book of Judges, we have a cycle. And the cycle in the book of Judges is this. God works in His people. They obey for a little while, but they begin to wander away from God. They begin to disobey, and they begin to follow other gods. And so God sends somebody like the Philistines or the Moabites to them, and those people will oppress them, they will correct them, and they will cry out to God for help, and God sends someone like Gideon, or Samson, and they deliver the people of Israel, and then the whole cycle starts over again. But in Samson's day, the people of Israel had gotten so comfortable with their sin and so accustomed to the oppression of the Philistines, for example, that they were no longer even trying to repent. They were no longer even asking for God's help. And so God intervenes, despite His people not even caring, and He sends Samson to begin to deliver the people of Israel. Now we're going to flash forward a few years after Samson is gone, and we've come to Samuel. And my guess is that for much the same reasons, because the people of Israel by and large have turned their backs on God, are not really paying attention to God, it says the words of God, God contacting His people even through a prophet in dreams, was rare. You know, of all the things that we can think of that that are hard in life, we could probably list a lot of things, things that we would dread or things that we wouldn't want to happen, things that would frustrate us, things that would make life difficult. And there's probably really a long list. Would the idea of God being silent be on that list? For the people of Israel, God has been silent as we get up to the approach of Samuel's life. And by the way, this also looks and foreshadows what's going to be happening in Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. When Jesus was born, some 2,000 plus years after the events of Samuel's life, we know that 
God had been silent. There had been no prophet in Israel for 400 years. The last book of your Old Testament is the book of Malachi. Malachi was, in fact, the final prophet of the Old Testament era. And the events of Malachi take place 400 years before Christ is born. And in that time, there was no prophet. There was no speaking on God's behalf. There was, all they had was the written copies of God's word in the temple. But God himself was not actively speaking to the people of Israel. It was a time of darkness. When we light these candles, and of course the room is well lit this morning, but when we light the candles of Advent, part of what's happening is this. The idea is that Advent begins in utter darkness. And each week as you move closer to the birth of Christ, you light a candle and it gets just a little bit brighter because the light is coming. That's part of the imagery of, of the Advent candle, the Advent wreath. By the way, we'll light a couple more candles and then on Christmas Eve, we'll light that center candle, the Christ candle. Anticipating the coming of the light of Christ. And so part of the birth of Samuel, part of the birth of Christ is that there is a time of darkness, a time of silence. And yet we're anticipating the coming of the light and the hearing from God. In Samuel's day, there had not been much communication from God. It was rare because his people had turned away from him. So that's what's going on. In addition to that, as we kind of take our picture away from the big overview of, of Israel, we hone in on, if you will, this woman named Hannah, her husband Elkanah. And we understand that Hannah is not able to have children. Setting here is that Elkanah loves her. There are two wives here, and Hannah is unable to have children. In fact, it's probably likely that the reason Elkanah has a second wife, Penina, is because Hannah was unable to have kids. So it's, it's probable, it's at least possible, if not probable, that the reason Penina is there to begin with is because Hannah can't have kids. Think in your own mind back to the story of Abraham and Sarah was unable to have children. So, you know, they arranged for the whole thing with her and Hagar and for him and Hagar. And it was important for them to have those kids. So Penina is probably there in the household because Hannah is unable to have kids. Now, specifically, why is Hannah unable to have children? It says there that specifically that God had closed her womb there in verse 5. Now, when we looked at Samson last week, it doesn't really tell us why that Samson's mother was unable to have ki kids. We just know that she was barren and unable to have children. It doesn't say why. But here, we have very specific uh, uh, indications that God was the reason Hannah could not have kids. He had specifically closed her womb so that she could not have children. And understand, in that day and age, and I'm grateful it's not that way today, but in that day and age for a woman who could not have children, she was seen as someone who was disfavored even under the curse of God. Part of the reason was this. If you go back to the promise that God made Abraham, that Abraham would have many descendants and that ultimately his descendants would bless the entire nations, all the nations of the world. So in Israel, it was seen if you could not have children, that you couldn't fulfill the promise God had given Abraham, and so you were seen as somehow spiritually unloved and cursed by God. So Hannah would have had that stigma on her, not only in the, in the culture at large, but Penina, the second wife of Elkanah, would have specifically looked at Hannah as someone who was somehow inferior in character, and in spirituality. So this is Hannah's plight. It's a time when God is not particularly active or, 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 or vocal in the people of Israel. It's a time of darkness in the, in the nation. But on top of that, for her, it's a period of silence. It's a period of darkness. And while she doesn't necessarily know this specifically, she has been, she is not able to have kids and is seen by those around her including in her own household, as someone who would somehow be cursed of God. So this is her situation. And on top of that, she's not receiving a lot of grace and mercy from Penina. Penina is constantly reminding her day in and day out about how miserable Hannah is. She's teasing her, she's poking her, she's being sarcastic to her. And the, the annual time every year when they go to Shiloh to worship, Penina makes it all the worse. To the point that we see here that Hannah can't even really engage in or enjoy 
going to Shiloh to participate in the annual worship of God. In fact, she dismisses herself from the meal. She, she exits away. So all those places, I want you to think about this. What is it that you do or where is it that you, you go when life is just hard that you need to, to escape? <laughs> you, do you have something you like to do? I know we're, kinda, we're in the middle of hunting season. And some guys have to go hunting. I was, when I was growing up, my thing was I'd go out in the back in the driveway and I'd just shoot hoops. I'd, I'd play basketball. That was how I got my mind right. Maybe you listen to music. Well, Hannah has nowhere to go. She can't go in public because everyone out there sees her as cursed. If she goes home, there's always Penina. And even when she goes to worship, she can't even do that because she, perhaps, she probably even sees herself as someone who is cursed or unloved by God. She's got nowhere to go. Now, to his credit, it appears that her, her husband, Elkanah, loves her. But she is unable to go anywhere or do anything else. So this is her situation. Israel is in darkness. Hannah is in darkness. And she is living daily with this idea that she is somehow inferior and unloved. We can look at the story. We can ask ourselves the question, why would the righteous woman seemingly be mistreated while the, uh, the other one who seems to be just a real jerk, <laughs> why does she have all the blessings? The truth is, we've, we've probably asked that question a few times in our own lives, haven't we? We've probably looked at the world around us and thought to ourselves, well, why do they have all that stuff? They're just not good people over there. Lord, I've done all these things. Why don't I have this stuff? You know, multiple times through scriptures, men like David and Haggai, even the apostles, asked the same question. Why does it seem the evil people win? <laughs> Why does it seem that the bad people have all the stuff and we here who are righteous are getting, getting hammered? Well, Hannah could ask that question. Maybe we would even ask it on her behalf. And it might be a good question to ask, except that we know that God's got something going on here. Now, we get a chance to read the story after the fact, so we, we know stuff that Hannah didn't know. But even today, we might be tempted to ask that same question, except for this. If, if we knew, if we thought that it was God's intention, that it was God's goal for us to be happy and blessed and have everything go our way in this life, and that if we were to be obedient to God, that would mean everything would always work out in this life. If we thought that was really what the Bible taught, then we would have legitimate questions here. But we know that's not the case. Despite what some would have you to believe from time to time, it is not God's primary goal for you to have everything you want in this life. God's goal for us here is to be made and molded into the image of Christ, to become a holy people dependent on Him, to be a people of faith so that we are prepared for the day when He does, in fact, meet our every dream in eternity. That's the goal. That's what God's preparing us for. You and I are not made primarily for the decades we'll have on this planet. We are made for eternity. And there is a plan that God is working. Now, Hannah doesn't see that. She doesn't know it. But that's what's happening here. So it's easy for Hannah, it's easy for the people around her to look at her and go, Hannah, you're wrong. Hannah, you are unloved. Hannah, you are cursed. Hannah, there's something wrong with you and God is punishing you. And that would have been the orthodox way of approaching her. But what they didn't know was that God had a plan. You know, there's oftentimes we have to acknowledge that you and I, we don't see everything the way God sees them. We don't see all the time with the eyes that God has. We don't recognize, and God doesn't always inform us of all the things that are going to be taking place in the future. He doesn't give us all the details. Remember, it's been some time. I was, a, I was still serving as a youth pastor, and the church I was at, we would do a fifth quarter uh, during football season. Fifth quarters and, you know, invite all the kids from the community out there, and we would generally serve hamburgers to like 100, 120 kids on a Friday night home game, and, um, and of course we had the time set up, and so I remember one particular Friday night we had a, 
a group, a large group of kids there. And of course, those things run late. You know, I mean, you don't even start till half hour or so after the football game. And and I remember this 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 mom had dropped up a couple of her daughters, and we made sure she knew what time was supposed to be done. And I don't remember what time it was now, but whatever time it was, we had finished up. Everybody had gone home, and these two young ladies were still there. Their mom had not picked them up. It's been a long day. It's after midnight. I want to go home, and here is a mom who hasn't picked up her kids from uh, from 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 the fifth, fifth from the fifth quarter, despite talking to her and her acknowledging what time she's going to be there. So it's it's gone late. We've got a couple of adults there. We're making sure we got everything taken care of, and. So finally, we, we, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a local police officer who would come out there and hang out with us and just make sure everything was okay. And I mean, it's well after midnight, and so um, we start trying to call mom. No answer. The girls don't know where she's at. The police go and knock on mom's door. She doesn't answer. So we start, eventually, almost after an hour, we eventually get a hold of a, grand, a set of grandparents in town and get them to... Uh, to grandma now i have to admit i was not full of grace and mercy that night not i never know the girls i was ticked off at the irresponsibility and the rudeness of that mom how could she do that to her kids how could she do it to me don't she know i'm tired it was sometime later uh, i was actually uh, actually it was about six months later i was uh, speaking and preaching um a service, a community service that following spring, and this lady who I didn't recognize came up to me, and she said, I don't know if you remember who I am, but I'm the mom who didn't come pick up those girls that night. Turns out what had happened is she was a diabetic, and she had fallen into diabetic shock not long after she had gotten home. She had passed out. In fact, her life was in danger. They found her the next morning, had to take her to the emergency room. She barely survived. Now, what, what, what happens to me? All of a sudden, I go from feeling angry and indignant and self-righteous to what? <laughs> there are things that we don't know. We don't know. The people around Hannah didn't know why she didn't have kids. Had God closed her room? Yes, God had closed her room, but it wasn't because she was sinful or unrighteous or cursed. It was because God had a plan. We, by the way, just need to be careful. We... We acknowledge that we don't always know everything <laughs> and that uh, maybe we need to exercise a little grace and mercy and compassion and patience and let God handle things. So this is where hand is at. God's closed her womb. She's in great pain. She doesn't know why. The people around her don't know why, even though they think they do, and she's desperate. She's hurting. She's confused. And so unable to celebrate with everyone else around her, unable to enjoy the meal at the time of worship in Shiloh. She, she, she gets away from everybody else, goes off on her own, and she begins a desperate prayer. And there's no other way to describe this. This is a desperate prayer from a desperate woman in pain and hurting, not understanding the circumstances she's in, not able to point to a reason why she seems to be cursed of God, and she prays. Verse 10, greatly distressed, prayed, and weeping all at the same time. And she begs God there in verse 11 for God to remember her and to give her a son. She says, I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life. A razor will never come on his head. We talked about that Nazarite vow last week with, 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 in regards to Samson. We won't go through that again, but it's the same idea. She goes, if you will just remember me, give me a son, and I'll give him back to you. And you may think to yourself, well, what's the point of having a son if you're just going to give him away? Well, just the fact that she would have a son would remove the shame. It would remove the stigma. It would remove the reputation. It would be a way of God delivering her. It would be a way of God rescuing her. In very many ways, Samuel's birth, even though she would never raise him as her own for the long, she wouldn't see him when he was, she wouldn't have him in, his, in, in her house when, she was, when he was eight, nine, ten years old. She wouldn't see him on a day-to-day -day basis when he was a teenager. Just the fact that he was there would remove her shame and stigma. His birth would rescue her. And so she goes, if you will rescue me with a son, 
If you'll deliver me with a son, Father, I will give him to you all the days of his life. Her desperation, the, the closed nature of her womb, led her to a point that she might not otherwise have, actually she probably wouldn't have ever otherwise gotten, and that was to a point of utter dependence upon God. You know, there are times that what God allows us to happen in our lives is not necessarily pleasant, it's not fun, it's difficult, it's heart-wrenching, it leads us to tears, but they can also sometimes, those events lead us to a complete, utter dependence upon God. And for Hannah, that's what had happened. The situation she found herself in was not meant to destroy her, it was meant to bring her to the throne of God. It was meant to bring her heart to a place of utter dependence upon Him, not upon herself, not even to worry about Penina or the culture around her, but to be content and dependent upon God Himself. If God said she was okay, she was okay. If God said she was blessed, she would be blessed. She wanted God's activity. She was at the throne before God in tears before Him. And she says this, if you'll give me a son, I will give him to you. I can't imagine being in her shoes, but one, I can't imagine ever as a parent being willing to give my kids away and not see them. That's kind of what God asked Abraham to do. And by the way, we're going to look at Isaac and Abraham next week. A little teaser. Isaac is the son of promise. He's the son of joy. His name means laughter. That's going to be fun here next week. I can't imagine saying the words that Hannah said, even though the truth is our children don't belong to us. They do belong, in fact, to the Lord. So she says, this, this is what I want to do. She, she sacrifices. Her worship here, her prayer is one of pleading, desperation, and faith, but it's also a prayer of sacrifice. David Platt wrote a book many years ago called Radical. In that book, he tells the following story. There was a church that was supporting a, a missionary pastor in the city of New Orleans. This church was sponsoring his work, and they would sometimes take mission trips to New Orleans, and they brought this guy in to preach. Well, I'm sorry, they, they had this, I'm sorry, they had this, this church planner they were preaching. So David Platt shows up to preach at this church as a guest. And he tells this story. He says, I got, to, I got up to preach on, he says, I got up to preach on going to all the nations with the gospel. When I finished, I walked down to the front while the pastor got up to close the service. These were his words. Brother David, we're so excited that all that God is doing in New Orleans and in all the nations and we are excited that you're serving here. Or, or, or so we're excited that you're serving there. And brother, we promise that we will continue to send you a check so that we don't have to go ourselves. Platt continues, he wasn't finished. He said, the, the pastor said, I remember a time at my last congregation when a missionary from Japan came to speak. I told the church that if they didn't give financial support to the missionary, I was going to pray that God would send their kids to Japan to serve as missionaries. This pastor saw going and serving God as punishment. <laughs> Platt would go on that book and just talk about how he was stunned <laughs> at what the pastor had said. The pastor had used the threat of obedience to God to get people to give. The truth is, when you encounter God, sacrifice is not as hard as we think it is. The biggest problem when a missionary speaks, and we've had a couple of missionaries here this last, this last year, just a few weeks ago, Brian and Emily Shores were here. Back in, back in um, the summer, uh, Ryan Rainbolt was here a, couple, a few weeks before that, you know, a few, a few weeks ago earlier in, in uh, November, uh, Stephen Daniel, church planter in Kansas City that we're partnering with was here. The truth is, when we hear a missionary speak, 
When we hear about what God's doing in places like Kansas City or Russellville or around the world, the biggest problem you and I should have is there are so many people volunteering to go, we don't know what to do with them all. Because when we meet and encounter God, when we have faced our, when we have come to God with the same desperation and trust and faith that Hannah has, and when we see God work in our lives and give us salvation, sacrifice, going, living for Him is a natural response. 2 Corinthians 5.15 is a verse we talk about quite a bit. It's kind of one of our theme verses here at the church. It's the, it's the verse that's behind the phrase, together for Christ with the gospel to the world that we have on our, on our church signs. And 2 Corinthians 5.15 talks about how that those who Christ died for, that all those who Christ died for, that they who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. If we have encountered Christ, if we have encountered the salvation that comes through the word of God, through Christ, and I'm, I'm, and I'm talking about W Word, capital W, Jesus Christ Himself being the Word. When we have encountered that salvation, when we have come face to face with the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, when we know what it means to have been rescued from our sin and from our shame, going is not a big ask. The truth is, sacrificial living, living on behalf of Him, is a really natural reaction. This pastor of this church, whoever he was, and Platt doesn't name him, and for obvious reasons, whoever he was had missed something incredible. He had missed the very God he's supposedly serving. To know God, to know Christ, to experience the deliverance that comes through Christ is to want to say, I will do whatever it takes to give back and say thank you, to make sure that not only is God honored, but others have the same opportunity. Sometimes giving back to God is financial. Sometimes it's going ourselves, it's giving of our time. Sometimes it's speaking to others, even if we're nervous and afraid of what they might say or we're not sure about what we, how, how the words might come out. By the way, it's usually all three. <laughs> when we tithe, when we give to missions, when we sign up to provide a meal for someone who's hurting, when we bring food for London Elementary School, when we purchase Christmas presents for kids at the school who don't have much, when we simply go up to someone at church we don't know and say hello, when we're willing to be uncomfortable or even hurt or maybe even afraid so that God is honored, these are acts of worship. It may not be that God will call us all to go to Africa or even to Kansas City. But we all have the opportunity to do things that make us uncomfortable. We all have the opportunity to talk to someone, to share with someone, to introduce ourselves to someone. The, the truth is, there's, there's probably people in this room that you don't know their name. You know what? Find, some who, some, find someone whose name you don't really know. Maybe you've seen them around and you're not sure you're uncomfortable. I'll be, I'll, I'll be embarrassed if they don't, I don't know their name. Who cares? <laughs> Greet one another. Find out their name. And if you tell them, if you see them next week, I know you told me your name, but I, my memory's bad. I forgot. Would you tell me your name again? No one's going to be offended. They might laugh a little bit. <laughs> it's okay. Someone needs a meal. Someone needs a ride. Kid needs a toy. There are more ways than we can possibly count. And most of these, quite frankly, aren't really all that sacrificial. <laughs> Even though, for some, I mean, let's be honest, no one's ever accused me of being afraid to talk to people. Uh, Angela and I have had this conversation a few times. I, never, I have never in my life ever seen myself as an extroverted personality. Angela goes, really? I don't see myself that way. So for me to talk to somebody, it was annoying her to no end, I think, at Yellowstone. We went to Yellowstone this past summer and, you know, Everybody's taking pictures, you know, so, oh, that's really cool, and oh, that's kind of cool. I just like meeting people from around the, you know, from, hey, where are you from? And she was constantly going, why do you keep talking to people we don't know? <laughs> I met people from Louisiana, met people, we met people from Arkansas, hey, it's kind of fun, you pull up, hey, look, there's, a, there's an Arkansas license plate over there, you know. Met people from Indiana who got family in Arkansas. I mean, all these, it's not a big deal for me to go up and talk to somebody. 
For some people, I realize it is. That's a scary thing. And you know what? For me to talk to somebody I don't know is not a sacrifice, but for somebody else it might be. And that's okay. Each one of us has those things that God can put in front of us to, uh, to do or to give. Hannah says, Father, if you will do this, Lord, if you'll do this, I will give him to you. She has a sacrificial, faithful, trusting heart. So she prays. Now, by the way, she has an intense prayer. Eli, the perceptive priest, thinks she's drunk. I have to admit, when I read that passage the first time, I'm going, why is Eli watching her lips? I don't know. Seems a little strange to me, but regardless, he thinks she's drunk. And I thought, you know, that's not the, that's not the only time in the Bible that God's doing something in someone's life and that other people think they're drunk. Yeah, I, I thought about Pentecost. That the, the, the apostles are preaching. What does the world think? They're drunk. Kind of makes me wonder, what does it look like for people who really are sold out to the Lord? <laughs> Maybe it looks like something a little different than we're thinking. You know, we, we tend to think about righteous people being all buttoned up and proper. You know, Eli thought Hannah was drunk when she was praying. They thought, they thought the disciples were drunk when they were preaching. David was dancing around half naked. There are times, I'm not, I'm not encouraging that, by the way, just, just so you know, when you see the Lord work, when you see, the work, when you see God active, when you see His people desperately dependent upon Him, you see things that look different than what this world looks like. Hannah is desperately praying. Eli doesn't really figure out what's going on, but he does. To his credit, once he figures it out, he is incredibly encouraging to her. And she prays. And, of course, God answers her prayer. And think about this. Think about what God did through the answer to Hannah's prayer that was born out of her desperation. The young man who would be born from Hannah would be the one who would not only... uh, be a righteous priest and prophet in Israel. But he would be the one who ultimately would anoint David as king. And David, of course, being the one through whom the Messiah was descended. Why was Hannah's womb closed for a time? I don't have all the answers to that, but I do know this, that the the resulting darkness from that closed womb The resulting desperation, the resulting going to God in desperate prayer birthed not only a son, it birthed a son who would anoint the king who would be the the descendant of our Messiah. Look at all that God did through history because of the desperate prayer of a desperate woman. The truth is, when when we come to God in faith, when we come to God in trust, did Hannah see all that coming? No. Does she know that someday her son would anoint Saul and anoint David? Not a clue. Does she know that the Messiah would come from the family that her son anointed as king? She had no idea. All she did was come in prayer and trust, and God did this. It's amazing. It's, it's, let's think about this for a moment. God may lead us to times of desperation. He may lead us through times of darkness so that we would pray and trust and depend upon Him. And who knows what God will do with the prayers of a desperate people? We pray on Sunday mornings. We have a group of ladies who come and pray on Tuesday mornings. We take some time to pray on Wednesday nights. But let's be honest. I'll speak for myself. Sometimes our prayers aren't really all that desperate, are they? We just kind of go through the motions. And I'm not saying there aren't those times for us, but when we find ourselves where Hannah was, realizing that we are completely upon dependent upon the the activity of God. We realize that He's worthy of our trust. Then we pray and we sacrifice 
And we may or may not ever see the result. You and I can pray desperate prayers for, for folks for salvation today. We can pray desperate prayers that God would send out missionaries. We can send, we can, and, and perhaps a lot of you this last week prayed for missionaries. We had the Lottie Moon, uh, the International Week of Prayer for, the, for international missionaries this last week through, uh, through, through Southern Baptist Convention. And perhaps some of you prayed this week. And you probably prayed for missionaries and people you'll never meet. And you have no idea how God will answer those prayers. You have no idea what will happen as a result of those prayers. You just trust God to, to, to do what's right. I know I've told the story before, but it's, it's, to me, it's, it's one of the things that stood out in my, in my own experience in this, in this vein. My, my um, second trip to Senegal, meeting a, a man um, who was having some severe back pain, who had gone to all the doctors, done everything he could, and no one could help him. He was just, just living in constant pain. And we had a team of folks who had met him the day before. He asked them to pray for his healing. They uh, weren't too sure what to do with that. Uh, so they, they, they prayed a good generic Baptist prayer, God, if it be your will. <laughs> you, you know, I prayed that, right? And I just felt, uncharacteristically me as a, as a, as a cool conservative Southern Baptist preacher, I thought, this is, this is, this is, not trusting on my part. So I went by there the next day, found him, introduced myself to him, told him I was with the same group. He told me the same story and asked me the same thing, and I prayed for him. I don't have any idea if God healed him or not. My prayer was simply this. God, this man's hurting, and he doesn't know who you are. Would you heal him? And would you act his life in such a way that he will know that Jesus Christ is God and he is the Savior, and you will bring him to faith? I don't have any idea what happened. He didn't just get up and start jumping around that moment. But I think it's okay to pray for God to save someone and God to demonstrate His power to someone. And I'm very comfortable with that. And maybe one day I'll get to see Him in heaven. I sure hope so. That'd be cool. <laughs> but I don't know. The truth is, we can pray and not ever see the answer. But look at what God did with the prayers of Hannah. Don't you think God can do something with your prayers as well? I'd like to take you through chapter 2 and Hannah's song of thanksgiving after Samuel was born. I would just encourage you to compare 1 Samuel chapter 2 with, the, with Mary's song in, in the Gospel of Luke. She recognizes what God has done. When we see the birth of Samuel, there are things in it that point us to the birth of Christ. It might be Mary's song and Hannah's song. It might be the darkness of Israel and the darkness that was in Hannah's life. It might be the centuries of people praying desperately that God would rescue them from that darkness the way people had in Israel for years and years and years, like Hannah's prayer. The truth is for us this morning, it may simply be this. Maybe we're not exactly where Hannah was. Hannah was. Maybe we are. But whatever God's doing in your life this morning, he, I know this, He wants you to pray. He wants you to trust. He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to do so freely. Not worry about whether someone thinks you're drunk or not. <laughs> and you might see the answers, you might not. But the God of Hannah, the God who birthed Samuel, who anointed David, from whom Jesus was ascended, is the same God that answers prayers today. The darkness that Hannah knew is the same darkness that some people, even this morning, in London, are experiencing. And just as you and I may have this morning seen and encountered the light of Christ, there are those around us who haven't yet, and maybe they're crying out. Maybe the Lord will send us to be the deliverer of the good news. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the word that you've given us through the birth of Samuel. We see the the situation that Hannah found herself in. And maybe we can identify, maybe we're not sure. But Lord, we all know what it means to be afraid. We all know what it means to be desperate at some point or another. And Lord, for perhaps most of us in this room, we know what it means to have encountered Christ, to have the darkness lifted and the light come. 
But maybe there's someone in here in this room, or maybe there's someone listening online that doesn't. Father, would you make yourself known to them as a candle lights up a room? Would you open up their hearts to the light of Christ? And Father, maybe there's some of us in this room that simply have have let our prayers become stale and dry. Maybe we're not sure you're listening. And we need to pray the way Hannah prayed. With desperation and with trust. With thanksgiving and with sacrifice. Father, would you work in our hearts this morning in whatever way you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as Craig leads us in a time of worship response. If you have some praying you want to do where you're at or up front, you want to have a conversation with me or Alan, whatever's on your heart, you respond as we sing. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. A couple of quick announcements before we are dismissed this morning. For those of you who signed up for the Joy Tree, the, the, those, those gifts that we're providing for kids from Londa Elementary, those are due back next Sunday. Is that correct? The 12th? So I know a lot of you have already gotten those back, but they need to be back by next Sunday. Um, 
Next Sunday night, December 12th, that's ne also next Sunday, we're going to do, we're going to go Christmas caroling. So I invite you, we're going to go singing, but we'll be outdoors. So you can sing, you don't have to worry about anything. We're going we're to go sing, we're going to do some caroling, and after we, we're going to probably break up a couple different groups and, and go sing for some folks, and we'll come back here, and we'll have, maybe it'll be a little cooler, you know, maybe it won't be 70 degrees next Sunday, but, no, I'm not really, I don't want to complain about 70 degrees, but, yeah, maybe a little cooler, and, and we'll have some, we'll have some, some snacks and some things after church. So we'll meet next Sunday night at 5 o'clock, go caroling, and then come back here for a, a time of, of, of fellowship afterwards. Um, also, uh, we had we just finished up our week of prayer, but these are still out there. If you didn't take one last week, or you can still pray for missionaries throughout the month of December, and I would encourage you, if you haven't taken one of these, to go ahead and take one and just pray for the work of our missionaries overseas. Um, in addition to that, we, throughout the month of December, take up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. This is a, an offering that 100% of the support goes directly to uh, those who are overseas doing the work of the gospel. And so I would encourage you to be thinking and praying about what God would have you do there. There are envelopes, there are Lottie Moon envelopes in the chairs, or in the back of the chairs that you can grab and make that a special envelope. A couple more quick notes. Uh, two week, or I'm sorry, a week from this coming Wednesday, so this would be December 15th, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, we will have our annual meeting where we talk, where we just, we uh, approve the budget for 2022 and all those types of things. So that'll be on Wednesday night, December 15th. Uh, but we are also going to have a second business meeting two weeks from today, immediately following the morning service. That meeting will be for this purpose. Uh, after some weeks of prayer and consideration and conversation, we are going, the personal team is, is recommending that we hire Craig Gunter as our new music leader and a music director, and uh, we're, we're excited about that. <laughs> He's like, ah. Um, so uh, two different things. One, on the 15th, and Wednesday on the 15th, we'll do the budget, things like that, but two weeks from today, we'll just, following the morning was our worship service, do a, a, a quick vote to call uh, Craig as our music leader here, at the worship leader here at the church. So we're excited about that, and on the personal team is, uh, he's, he's, He's dotted all the I's across all the T's. He's legal and everything. So we're, 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 we'll do that here in a couple weeks. So I want you to know that um, God has been providing and God has been working over these last few weeks, and we're looking forward to what God will do in the next coming weeks as well. All right. Did I forget anything, Alan? Okay. Looks like I did good. All right. We will be dismissed with this from Revelation uh, chapter 1. Oh, yeah. To him who loves us, and released us from our sins by His blood, and who has made us to be a kingdom, priests to God and to Father. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And we're dismissed.